Okay, just picking up where I last left off, uh, it's been kind of a while, but I'm just going to do a real quick review of chapters 7 through 9 of uh, Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. These chapters, kind of like some of the other ones, they don't really even necessarily mention many Jewish individuals, besides like one, I guess, which I'll discuss, but um, it's more of just like, again, like kind of like the proto-reformers and the reformers themselves being Judaizing heretics and stuff like that, but it doesn't actually really deal with too much like JQ stuff, so um, from here on out, I'm just gonna like do like small reviews of his chapters, unless it deals with like a JQ issue that I feel like is appropriate to tackle, because again, that's the main reason why I'm doing this channel, but I still want to cover every chapter he does, because I still think it's interesting in its own right, and I think it's um, a solid view from like a traditional Catholic perspective, just like on history and like the Reformation and stuff like that. So beginning in chapter 7, he discusses the dispute between the humanists and the obscurantists, most notably Johann Reuchlin, I believe it's pronounced, and Johannes Pfeifferkorn. And Pfeifferkorn is a Jewish convert to Catholicism, and Reuchlin is this Catholic dude, but he is like a proponent of learning Hebrew and the Kabbalah and stuff like that, and he thinks it's a useful tool to like aid the Christian in their walk and stuff. Like he kind of believes in this like weird magic of the Kabbalah and that like Hebrew is the original language of man and stuff like that, so it has has, like supernatural powers whereas Pfeifferkorn is more skeptical of Hebrew or not really skeptical of Hebrew but just skeptical of like this in Jones's view kind of like Judaizing going back to the Old Testament going back to Hebrew and seeing that as like more profound than just like going you know using the regular means of just like that the church has provided so he discusses a little bit about their arguments and how Reuchlin defends the Jewish a lot of Jewish texts and there's a dispute whether or not they should burn the Talmud again kind of like in centuries past he brings up how Reuchlin, in a sense, is is a like racialist. Like he still thinks that Jews are like racially bad, whereas Pfeifferkorn, as a convert to the Catholic Church, like is no longer a Jew really in the spiritual sense. So anyway, it's just kind of like that trope again, which we've seen in some of the previous chapters. And he just says that that Reuchlin's uh, humanism, which coincides with like Erasmus and they were kind of like proto-reformers or like a little bit before the Re Reformation happened, like those ideas of like going back to the text itself and going back to Hebrew, like the language and not really relying on church tradition and rather just going to the actual like language and textual uh, analysis is, um, you know, what led to the Reformation. And so chapter eight talks a bit about uh, the Thomas Munzer and the um, Peasant Rebellion. And Munzer was basically just this like reformer guy who like went above and beyond what Luther came up with, just in terms of, like, totally overthrowing, like, any and all authority. He was, like, a millennialist, if that, or if that's the right uh, term, like, kind of, like, some other people that he thought the world was ending and wanted to bring in, like, the thousand-year reign of Christ or whatever. Luther was opposed to him, the Catholic Church was opposed to him, just because he was, like, this kind of, like, anarcho-communist kind of guy, um, and thought, like, that he could bring on the, you know, kingdom of God through revolution, and in Jones's view, that's looking back at the Old Testament way of doing things, like the Old Testament, you know, Hebrews and stuff who, like, conquered land and whatnot, rather than Jesus's, like, kind of more spiritual kingdom of God is within you kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, he uh, brings up that and how the Peasant Rebellion was, you know, dealt with. Um, I'm just kind of speeding through it because it doesn't really... Too important, the details, you can read it if you want, it's interesting. Um, and then chapter 9, he deals with a specific Anabaptist uh, group that led, like, an even crazier revolution in Munster, led by John of Leiden, or John Bolkazun, I don't know how to pronounce that, and basically just like, again, with more like, uh, the world's about to end, and going off of Old Testament, uh, rather than new, you know, not caring about church authority, being even too crazy for the reformers, like, and Jones uh, makes this point that like, a lot of the reformers like Luther are kind of like the moderate, like moderate wing of the radicals, and compares them to the Mensheviks, Whereas there are other people who are like the Bolsheviks, like the radical radicals, if you will. Uh, yeah, it's just like an interesting like case study. And basically Jones is just looking at like the extremes that the Reformation brought about and like what can happen when you use Sola Scriptura. And in Jones's view, Sola Scriptura is this, you know, basically just like a doctrine that can lead to a bunch of spiritual and frankly like physical chaos more or less, which um, is not like a crazy view, like obviously he has the Catholic view and Protestants have the Protestant view and they can defend Sola Scriptura if they would like, but yeah, that's just his view on it, and um, there's not too much mention of like actual Jews in these chapters besides Pfeifferkorn, who I already mentioned. Um, I do want to bring up the book Scapegoat of Revolution by Judd Teller. Uh, I think it's a good companion book to read if you're reading uh, Jones's book because 
it starts off with the Reformation and basically from there goes throughout like various periods in European history and how the Jews were like, you know, you can tell from the book, were a scapegoat more or less. Um, and Teller uh, does go through the peasant war a little bit um, and the Reformation and just he kind of echoes what Jones said in previous chapters that Jews would sometimes go to church authorities to help protect them from like the more like radical people who weren't necessarily abiding by church rules. Um, and so he talks about uh, Josel of Rosheim, who was like this Jewish, I guess, spokesman who uh, advocated for the Jews, advocated to Emperor Charles V for the Jews, like protection and stuff like that. And he basically said that like during the Reformation, like the Jews were, you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like they didn't really get along with the Lutherans. They didn't really get along with the Catholics um, and, you know, died a lot, just like anyone else during the Peasants' War. He does make the distinction, though, between Lutherans and Calvinists essentially saying that the Lutherans were less tolerant to the Jews than the Calvinists were. And um, his main reasoning behind that is because Luther, from Teller's point of view, he still has this kind of like, I don't really know how to describe it, I guess like a German way of looking at the world and like still kind of adopts this like view that the Jews have a certain role and that their role is basically like killers of Christ and like there's nothing they can do to change that, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in Calvin's view, like, as long as, and it's kind of tied up with the Protestant work ethic, like as long as you're like an industrious, hard worker kind of person, like you, if you're successful in business, like that's the kind of person that Calvin would look forward to in his society and be tolerant of. I mean, this is like an oversimplification, but I'm just talking about what Judd talks about. Um, so yeah, it's just like, anyway, I just want to bring up that book because I'll probably be using it in the future for Jones's, for the review of Jones's work. But yeah, I, I, um, I'll just end there, but I do think it's kind of, odd like uh how jones views the old testament and like what he calls judaizing and stuff like when most people look at a, like study any kind of text like you want to know the original text i don't know why he's like thinks it's bad necessarily to go to the hebrew and study it and stuff i mean if the if the old testament was written in hebrew then i think that's uh reasonable to study that language so it is like a very like very like old school Catholic view of things like oh the, like the Bible shouldn't be in the vernacular and like blah 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 like only the church has the authority to interpret which is fine like that's a theological view but I do think it's like it's just his view it's it's the standard Catholic view and I don't know like that's just always good to keep in mind while reading this book so anyway see so yeah.